You know, I think we should make a um a pact. If we um get to a certain age in our life and we don't have kids, we should have one together. I 100% think that would be a great thing to do. Great. I'm going to freeze my eggs. <laughs> yeah, I'll freeze my eggs. Uh, sperm. Can you freeze your sperm? <laughs> I don't know if you can, but I'm happy to. We can put it away in a fridge and... Fridge. <laughs> Just place it in the fridge. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Not So PG. I'm Brooke Lurton. And I'm Maddie Mills. And we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're recording our podcast from, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We'd like to pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect and love to all you mob tuning in today. Here, here. I thought it'd be a little bit fun, a little bit cheeky, a little bit naughty. You're to- always naughty. Oh, you know me too well. <laughs> but look, um, I put up a little uh, thing on Instagram, and so did you, a little burning questions box. We did. We, we wanted to know interesting what interesting you- <laughs> replies. <laughs> <laughs> we did. It feels I- like we've opened the floodgates. <laughs> To be honest, my DMs are like floodgates. If I'm being honest, I get some really weird and unusual requests. What else is like floodgates? You tell me. Feet photos. (gasps) I get asked for feet photos all the time. Wait, were you asking me what my floodgates were? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, how no, did I'm this kidding. turn into like a <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Duck? But um, look, uh, we did open the floodgates to our, you know, Instagram and they have sent some interesting questions through that I reckon we should unpack. Some Absolutely. of these are a bit raunchy, but that's what the pod is about, babe. Not so PG. Exactly. We're keeping it real. We kind of want to let you guys in. But there was one question, and let's just start with this one, why don't we? There was one, uh, it was one of the first uh, questions that were sent through, and it was, how big and thick is your budu? Ah! Stop it! <laughs> no! Yes, and then after that it said the thirst is real. This is something that I will not be answering on the pod. <laughs> why not? So if anyone didn't know what budu means, budu means your penis. Yeah, that long thing. Oh, I gave it away. It's mm, your there eggplant. We go. Your eggplant. Your thing between your legs. <laughs> eggplant emoji, right? Uh, insert here. And this is what Not So PG is all about. We're going to answer a couple of your questions and let's jump into it. All right, Brooke, I'm going to ask you the first question. What was the hardest lesson you had to learn? Mm. The thinking face is on. The thinking cap. What is she thinking about? Mm. The hardest lesson. The key word. I think hardest uh, really put you off there, didn't can it? You just say, can you just say hard one more time, for fuck's sake? <laughs> what was the hardest lesson you had to learn? Um, I think it is trusting strangers. Mm. Or not putting so much trust into people um, immediately. I have been, you know, a really overall sort of work. Like, I think growing up, I've always been a very open minded person. And growing up, I feel like I, I allow a lot of energy in because I feel like I draw people in and I, I want to get to know people. And I have opened, you know, the door to people that haven't always had my best interest at heart. And that was a really hard lesson for me to learn is that not everyone. Has your back. Has your back. Mm. Yeah. I had a lot of uh, friendships that, yeah, made me learn that very, very quickly. Yeah. I think that's a really good lesson to learn early on in life. And I suppose, like, you know, with our upbringing, I'll speak from my point of view, I definitely learnt um, that it was uh, difficult to trust strangers as well. Like, Mm. I remember um, one of the first um, things when I was taken into foster care was um, that the lady who put us in the car told us that we were going half an hour drive away. And um, instead of going half an hour away, she drove us for two and a half hours and gave us no explanation. We went up past the central coast. So we're taken from, you know, Campbelltown. And she was like, oh, we're only going to be in the car for half an hour. Gave us a teddy bear to shut us up in the back of the car and just drove us for like hours. And that was like the first lie of the system. So, you know, I think my trust issues came from that and I want compensation. Where's the money? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no. Wow, Maddie, that's like, yeah, that's a really... Sorry to get deep so quickly. No, do you know what? That's what it's all about, right? That is a very 
I don't I don't trust the system. I've worked in it and I've been a part of it and I can see and exactly resonate with that feeling of being like, who the fuck are these strangers yeah. in my life? And I think I should, you know, I kind of do now naturally hold a lot of people at arm's length until they kind of prove themselves to me and then I'm like, okay, huddle in now. You can be a part of my circle. But that doesn't get to that point for a very long time. So if, you know, if you are holding them at arm's length, how do they prove themselves to you? I think it's consistency and it's time and I don't always – I think for me it's about um, your morals as a person. Like do you believe in the right things, like the same things as me? And I guess for me it's like – like I've I've had people come in and out of my life all the time. Like the – there has not been one consistent person that I've had since I have been born. Wow. Right? Oh. Except for my brothers who were born after me. Yeah. But since I was born, people have come in and out of my life. Even my birth father has come in and out of my life when he picks and chooses. So yeah. there has not been one consistent person since the day that I was born that has been there from then till now. And I'm 27 years old. Wow. Bro. So that for me is like a, a showing of how people have come in and out of my life at different points and different times and why I don't trust a lot of people. And, you know, you might meet me on a first glance and, you know, first impression and think that I trust you, but I never trust someone straight up 100%. Like, it takes me a very, very long time and they have to prove their spot. I know that sounds so harsh in a way. But you're protecting yourself. It is. Self-preservation, babe. That's it. And a lot of people don't know that is how protective I am of my space. Like even in my relationships, at points I still felt like they were a stranger in my house. Yeah, wow. And that's how much I have such a big problem with trusting. And I've acknowledged it. Like I've done a lot of therapy and I'm working through it, but – to prove themselves is consistency, it's time, it's like if they have my back and it's if they show up for me. Yeah, I love that. I mean, consistency is key in any area of your life, right? It's sort of the building blocks. If you can build a really stable foundation and build upon that by being consistent, showing up, doing what you say you're going to do, that's sort of the the structure of success really in a relationship. But how, totally. can, how can you say... I guess my question to you, Maddie, is we haven't had a lot of stability. Mm. So how do we know what that looks like? Yeah. And how do we get it when we've never had it? Yeah. And that's my question is like, that's what I mean. What does it look like to you and what does it look like to us with people, young kids that we were growing up having no stability, no parental guidance and no one to say, I've got you, here I am, and I'm not going to let you fall. Mm. That for me, that's absurd because majority, you know, of the population of young people have mum dad to fall. Right? Mm-hmm. We didn't have that. Yeah. And so we've built stability on our own backs, like yeah. literally. Like, totally. We are our own rocks. Yeah. And um, I, th- I think that sometimes, like even in relationships, that because of the difference between, you know, um, but between even my experiences in life and my partner's experiences in life, we see the world very differently. Yeah. We have very different ideas of what um, what family look like, what is important. Um, in what term- does that look like as a whole for you in yeah. terms of like your family structure, well, you know, stability? You know like- it's really interesting that my partner has everything that I didn't have. So my partner's family is everything that as a young kid I wish that I had. He had the most supportive mum and dad. They worked their butt off to be able to provide for him. They continue to, you know, um, be a very tight-knit family and very um, solid family when it comes to, you know, the support within within their inner circle. And that's something that I, I never experienced growing up. I never had someone in my family who really backed me or was able to provide, um, you know, that structure for me or even, um, you know, structure and routine. It was so unstable, my childhood. So for me, it is natural to gravitate towards instability and less natural to accept 
uh, structure and routine. Yeah. And so it's it's hard because you're sort of in this battle because you want it so bad, but it isn't it isn't something that you know well That's enough. It. So it can be a little bit daunting or overwhelming sometimes. Um, but it is something that I crave. Um, but for me, my, all of my experiences growing up were, were based in instability. So that's where I, that's sort of my comfort place. And mm. it's unfortunate because you don't want that to be your comfort place. No, but <laughs> to be honest, it's a safe place to be, right? If you have mm. stable. Well, you know what? If people haven't turned up for you, you learn. Like I, I, I was such a, like when I was a little kid, I was someone who asked a lot of questions. Me too. And I was, I was like, why? Yeah, yeah, why? yeah. Why? The five and whys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was called um I was called a detective. Like I remember my mum was always like, Oh, he's the detective, he's the detective. Because I would I I needed to hear information. I needed the information to be able to know if things were gonna be okay or not. And a lot of the time they weren't going to be okay. And I but I still wanted to know so that I could prepare myself. Safety. You know? Yes. This is why we're so fucking alike. It's because Literally, I got told that I was like a curious cat or an inquisitive kid all the time. Yes, because inquisitive, I always that wanted word, to yeah. know why. I was like, why are we doing this? Yes. And my teachers got in high school, they fucking hated me sometimes because I would yep. be like, why, why are we doing this? Yeah. Like the first fleet. Why are we learning about first fleet? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I don't know what the fuck this is. Why am I learning about British colonizers? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, from that first question, well, the hardest lessons we've learned is – Pretty much fucking showing up for ourselves. Yeah. Because, and you know, at the end of the day, we have to show up for ourselves because nobody else will. You know what I mean? As much as like we want, we, we, you know, love the idea that we have supporters and, you know, people who want to see us win. The reality is, is that we're creating, uh, our future is by design. It's not by default, you know, or it's, and it's not been handed to us on a silver platter. We've had to work for every single bit of success um, that we've sort of come into contact with. It's, yeah. I, and I also think that, like, I, I, I love uh, – the reason I use my partner's family as an example is because I remember the idea of what I wanted in life is so what he has – yeah. And I think that, like, it, and it's beautiful to see, but I also know that, like, everyone's upbringing is different. Everyone's experiences are different. Not, you know, not everything is um, the white picket fence Australian dream, 100%. you know. 100%. And, and look, you and know what? The, the challenges are really what made me who I am. Exactly. It's, and the, they made Paulie who he is. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you guys have this beautiful relationship that yeah. I love. Come from two and different I strive worlds. For. And <laughs> we'll never have that. <laughs>Okay, so another question, speaking of love, another question that has come up in this burning question box is, what do you think your love language is and why? Have you done work on love languages? Do you understand, like, have you, you know, the five love languages? Is it five? I'm pretty sure there's five. As yeah. she rolls her fucking eyes. Yeah, she does roll her <laughs> eyes. Um, okay, so do you know what yours are? Might have changed over the years. I think as a person, you grow, right? And things change, priorities change. When I first started dating, you know, your typical uh, love language, I think mine started off as physical touch. I loved being tactile. I loved, you know, cuddling and I loved sort of being affectionate and intimate um, with people. I think that's how I receive love. That's my receiving love language. My giving love language I didn't. I th- I thought it was uh, affirmations um, originally. I, I love telling people, you know, how beautiful they are, how how lovely they are, and you know, and, and boosting them up. Like I'm, I'm your biggest hype girl. Like you know, and um, that's that's always how I've always been. But I've 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 realised that I'm actually acts of service, yeah. and that hasn't changed. So my acts wow. of service of how I give love is acts of service. How I receive love is. Is different. It's quality time now. So going back mm-hmm. to that first original question is that I do keep a lot of people at arm's length until you prove themselves. And that also is my my based in my relationships as well is one of my love languages, yeah, has, has switched over to that quality time because I've realised that I, I'm all about that lustful intensity and that affection and, and you know, hot sex and, and spending time with one another. But I need to spend a lot of time 
and 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 I'm getting to a point where like you know I'm holding out of that first initial intimate uh, intimacy because I want to get to know someone on a deeper level before I even open myself up to that. I thought you said horning out, and I was like, "Oh, well, she horning out? What, yeah. is, what is that word?" Horning out. But <laughs> um, I'm holding out. No, I get it. I totally get it. I think for me, um, what's your, sorry, what's your love language? Yeah, I, I think. Can I uh, guess? Yeah, please have a little I'm guess. guess. Okay. okay, so I think Maddie, mm. how you receive love is, I'm gonna say, being told. So affirmations. No. Fuck. No, that's not how I receive love. Aww. I am a big physical touch person. Ah, that was going to be my next one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, I, I love um, being, you know, physically intimate with someone. I love affection. I love cuddling. I love being touched and held and holding someone. For me, that's like massive. Um, and that's how I feel love. How I give love is by giving. I feel like I'm a very generous person, and I Acts give of service. Yeah, and I wait. Are we the same? Was that the same? I feel it like... was. It was what you were. I think what you, I was. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, I but, was, yeah what I was. What I was. What I was. What I was. But for me, like I, I'm someone who's very generous with my time, energy, money, success. Like I feel like I give a lot of myself to everyone, and like sometimes I think I, I need to pull back a bit because I because I give so much of myself that I don't have anything left for my own, you know, being. But especially my family, like, I feel like I've always been, you know, someone who supports my family entirely. And um, and I haven't ever um, wanted to stop doing that. That's the way that I show them love. That's the way that, you know, being able to provide um, something. Yeah, but um, I could see that. I could definitely see that that would be your personality. That's yeah. exactly the same with me. And I think it is just in our nature to do that, right? Yeah. Like acts of service for me. Like my thing is if I ever host something or if I go home and I'm with my family is that I just want everyone to be fed and happy. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's like such a mother hen thing to do, but that's just how I've always been and that's how I'll always be. Yeah. And I even sometimes do it at my own detriment in my relationships. I'm such a mother hen. Like I will I will come home from a fucked up day and yeah. I'll still cook, clean and do all the things that I need to do to make sure my partner is well fed, loved and happy. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds, like a, that sounds like a fucking domestic housewife, to be honest. <laughs> but like I, that makes me happy, knowing yeah. that they're happy. And I realise that I don't ro- really sometimes don't, don't pri- prioritise myself. Yeah. Um, and I, I really need to. And you're probably the same. Well, yeah, I think that for me, like, I, I, I'm I, a sucker for, um, you know, for the downtrodden. Like, if someone is down and out, I'm someone who... Will be there. Will be there. Like, yeah. I'm... And I... And with I've, a bottle of wine in the hand or, you know... You know, even, like, I'm, I'm for the little man, you know? Like, I'm, I'm at the, for the... Stop. <laughs> Are you about to say... You always stick up for the little guy. Yeah, I always do. I and and it's always been a part of me. Fucking soulmate, I swear (laughs) to God. But like it, it, and it is so natural for me to do that. Like, and uh, and I hate when people go without. So I'm happy to go without for people to have a what you know what they need. And I think that that's always just been ingrained in me, just through um, you know my family as well. Even though they're not able to reciprocate what I give them, it still is, um, it still is, um, I would say a symbiotic relationship. Ooh, I sound clever. <laughs> you are clever. You but it are. Is, you know, we need each other, um, you know, because yes. at the end of the day, they mean so much to me. So I'm so happy to be able to like, you know, continuously just be there for them yeah. to the point where like, you know, I, we've, we booked a holiday for this year and, um, and there was some, you know, issues in my family, and and I, my my I was saying to my partner, I was like, you know, what, I'm just gonna pay for everyone, and he had to stop me, like literally stop me, because I wanted. But that's what to, you want to do because you to, want them yes, there. I wanted to yeah. give them that joy of not having to stress about worrying about like the holiday and the money involved, and I just wanted them to get on the plane with me, see their smiles and yep. land in Fiji and have an amazing family holiday. I did stop myself this time. It's not something that I normally do, but this time I did stop myself, which I think is a good lesson. It's called boundaries. Yes. And it's something, right, that we will probably unpack in another podcast episode because I feel like I have really learnt the word boundaries in the last couple of years and it has changed my fucking life yeah. to the point where I feel like, 
you know, I can dif- differentiate what is where I'm at in terms of my capacity and what I can give and then pulling back if I need. But re- being able to communicate that is another thing. Yeah, I think, you know, when, when we spent um, a bit of time together up in up in Byron, I think we, we had this conversation around boundaries and I, mm. and I loved hearing all of that stuff because um, for me, I'm someone who who finds it hard to put up boundaries. I sort yeah, of am. it's hard, am, especially I, family. I'm, family community yeah. is your your life and that's how we as First Nations people are built is that family and community is everything yeah. and no matter what, you always help the little guy out. Guy out. Yeah. You, guy? Guy. Fly. And, you know, it's sometimes at our own detriment. Like we're run down fucking financially at a place. What, do you, what I'm trying to say is that you could, yeah, you're, if you're at capacity, you have to remember you have to fill your cup up um, yeah. and, yeah, you can't pour out. But I wanted to ask you a question, I guess, back on um, love languages and, and relationships. Like, did you ever have a partner who didn't get your love language or sort of didn't understand it and um, pushed back? Or Yeah, like, I wouldn't say so much pushed back, but Paul and I have different love languages and I think that we, because we did some therapy about this. We Ooh. actually, yeah, we went and did... Therapy couple, is my favourite word. therapy. It is so good. It really was helpful, you know, um, and it was, you know, a, a decision that we both made that we, we wanted to know more about each other when we wanted help. We wanted to have a third person's perspective on some issues that we were, you know, struggling to get through as a, as a partnership. You did the work. We did I the work. I admire that. I and admire that. we have always been committed to doing the work and we haven't stopped doing the work. It's something that we, you know, continuously do. When there's a hiccup, we continuously do the work. And I think, um, you know, uh, my Paul isn't like the most affectionate person and that's something that I need, you know. Yeah. So there there have been, you know, problem not problems, but there have been um, moments where I've felt, you know, that I wasn't receiving love from Paul because he's not as if, as affectionate as me. And see, Paul's um, one of Paul's love languages is quality time, and mm. and for me, like it, I wasn't, um, I suppose. Uh, responding to his love language either. So we were sort of caught in a bit of a, you know, a bit of a pickle, but we worked it out in the end and, um, you know, we, we now know exactly what our love languages are and how to... It is about communication though, right? Yeah. It is about, like, what communicating what you need versus, mm. um, you know... And I love being so open about that stuff with, like, a partner, you know, being able to have conversations at that deep level of, like, what you need, what your experiences have led you to believe and what you can unpack with, like, the par- your partner who may not have the same experiences. I love that, philosoph- like, philosophy chat. Like, bring it on. Like, I'll lay in bed and talk <laughs> about that all night. That's, need that. that's a turn on for sure. Well, yeah, I've actually probably never had someone who is much of a deep thinker than I am. Sorry, oh. I've never had anyone or in my relationships that I feel have had the same deep thinking or, I guess, the same energy um, to what I bring. Well, that's because... That's not really, like, arsehole Because you like but... it deep. I mean, you are a deep thinker. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Okay, there was another question, and I think this is going to be a fun one. What was the worst date you've ever been on? Have you had some fucking dud dates? Oh, the entire bachelorette. Not kidding. No. Uh- <laughs> okay, okay. Let's just we'll quickly do like a little nose dive into that. Was there a date that you absolutely hated on the show? I found it really awkward why I always got the shower scenes in The what? Bachelor and The Bachelorette. I always got the steamy hot shower outside scenes. You didn't want to do that. It's hot, but it's and it's steamy. But it just didn't make sense to me. Like, <laughs> it was cold. I <laughs> know, both times it yeah. was fucking freezing. And here I am, fucking getting like literally a small little spurt of water. Was it warm water? It was warm water, but it's, it just doesn't make sense. Anyways, I'm going to go back. Like, fuck the bachelorette. Yeah, like, fuck we'll that just leave off. it off for a sec. Okay. But what's the worst date I've ever been on? Mm-hmm. What about what's the worst date experience? Because I've had a what's really. What's the difference? What are you... <laughs> this is the thing. Because it went on from one date to a second date to three, four dates. And it went to a point where I didn't think it was ever going to go. Right. So the short version is that. 
I was in Cairns for a conference, for the Uluru Statement, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I remember when you were up there. Yes. And we went for drinks with the crew at 7. Oh, we went for dinner at 7. And I wasn't feeling well from the food. So me and my friend went up to our room to chill out for a few hours before everyone was going out for drinks afterwards. So for two hours, we thought, fuck it. Let's jump on Tinder. Now, I haven't Tinder been on... Tinder in cans. What are you going to match with a crocodile? <laughs> <laughs> Practically, right? This was for a God. bit of fun. Fun. That's all. And so we jumped on Tinder. She was doing sobriety and celibacy. So she was living through my experience of this, you know, Tinder thing that I thought, fuck, this would be funny. I've been on Tinder literally since I was 18 and never again. And so we're matching and, you know, we're having a bit of fun, swiping through, being, you know, I guess just idiots and having, you know. And she said, never date a guy called Matt. (gasps) Oh, that bitch. Oh. But I have a bit of a story. Anyway, so we went, ended up going out for drinks, started feeling better, so we went out for drinks and we had a good I night. Think you were drinking and you're bringing your sober companion along with you. <laughs> oh, she ended up breaking her sobriety. Oh. Yes, because I needed a really good wing woman. And so <laughs> we went to this, I don't know if you've ever been to Gilligan's, I think it's called. Gilligan's in Cairns. It's, it's a bit of a backpacker's fun. It's fun. It's really good fun. And so we ended up there and I matched with a guy on Tinder and he ended up um, saying something like, oh, uh, look great in active wear. And I was like, thank you. And he was like, oh, where are you heading tonight? And we said, oh, we might be going to Gilligan's anyways. We ended up there. A we ended up- Jane photo shoot. <laughs> Sponsored. <laughs> and we ended up there having fun and I was getting photos. How embarrassing. I was getting photos with these people and then he comes up and he's like, I'm like, oh, yes, hello, you're the architecture. Ec- sorry. Hello, you're the architecture. Yes, the architecture. Yeah, I know. No, I'm kidding. It's my lisp. <laughs> I haven't even got my Invisalign in. And so the guy who builds, who designs the buildings. Well, yes, that's what architecture is, babe. <laughs> the guy's good at maths. Yep, great. Not- Move on. <laughs> so I look at him and he's like, hey, how are you? So we start talking, you know. Hey, how are you? Is that how he sounded? <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm from Cairns. He wasn't from Cairns. We find out that he is from Melbourne. Oh, I was going to you were going to say with that accent. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's my hey, how are you? <laughs> how you going? And so, anyways, we chat and he comes back to the hotel with me. But I end up getting food poisoning. So I'm sick. I called you when you had food poisoning. Yes. I remember this. Yes. So he comes back with me. He stays the night. We do not do anything. I am so unwell that night and that whole day. This poor man has stayed to the morning and been like, what the fuck? He didn't even leave in the night. Like, I was like, I was What do you mean this poor man? You mean the homeless man who didn't have a bed to go home to that just used your hotel? You should be saying, he should be saying thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. You're welcome. Right? He ends up leaving in the morning. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I was so sick. He comes back that afternoon to check on me and brings me a tea. and a, oh Yeah, tea. And I'm like, oh, that's really sweet. So we go for a walk because I'm starting to feel better. And we're just chatting. And then he tells me that he just bought a dog. And I was like, how exciting. Like, let's figure out a name for this dog. And we're walking. We went through this, like, Aboriginal gallery in Cairns. He was really nice guy. He was a bit boring, like a bit stale, like he didn't have that much going for him. But I was like, you know what, I'm worth... Oh, my God, great description. Stale, boring, don't have much going for you. (laughs) Bye. It gets worse. Right, anyways, I go, we say our goodbyes and we, you know, we say we'll catch up in Melbourne. I get back to Melbourne, feeling better. Bloody hell, fucking skinny after two days of shitting myself. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Not all glamorous over here, folks. (laughs) Brooke Burton living the glamorous life on the cover of Women's Health and she's shitting herself. (laughs) Anyways, so... We get back to Melbourne and I tell my housemates that I met this really nice guy. I had just sort of gone back to dating. I deleted Tinder after that. I was like, fuck that. Like, I am off it. So, 
the key word that you've used is nice. Like, do you want to be friends? Because you said that it was super boring, um, not much going for him, <laughs> the rest of it. And now you're like, you get back to Melbourne, like, I met this nice guy. So he's like a mate now. So he's just nice. I, I, like I said, right? I love those lustful, intense chemistry moments. That and you didn't I'm have just trying to. shitting yourself. <laughs> Anyway, I'll let you continue. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know what? I've always gone for these like bad boys, like this, you know, like this really intense kind of, you know, out there fucking Gemini kind of creatures. Excuse me. I'm a Gemini. Exactly. <gasps> rude. Kidding. So I That's thought, oh, this book, nice, wholesome guy. Maybe he's a bit boring. Maybe, I, you know, he's a bit shy. That's what I kept saying. He was a bit shy. Anyways, we get back to Melbourne and I'm like, okay, do you want to catch up for a wine? So he comes over for wine. He stays at my house. We get on the wines with my housemates. Good night. Doesn't try a fucking thing. Yep. See, he's literally looking for a bed. Like he is literally like just taking you up on the offer of accommodation. He doesn't, he doesn't want it. He wants a comfy bed and a good pillow. <laughs> Seriously. It's a koala bed. So yeah, see, that's exactly koala that. mattress. Yeah, and so he doesn't try a thing. He doesn't try a thing, and I'm thinking, is this me? Like, I'm thinking, this is my first sort of experience from like jumping back into dating, right? Post mm. the show, and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna give it a hot crack. Give it a hot crack with some dud from Cairns, <laughs> from Melbourne. Lived in Melbourne, but I met on Tinder in Cairns. Oh, Lord. Anyway, I am about to go down to my trip to Inverloch to do a book retreating. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take two nights by myself and do some book writing. I had to catch up and I was on my way and he's like, oh, hang on, hang on. Like, I want to see you before you go and I want you to meet his dog, Winston. <sighs> Sounds awful. So I'm like, okay, bring your dog over. He can meet Cobra. And I was so excited because I'm like, I love puppies. As you know, I love your dog. And so he comes over. He brings Winston. My His housemates are there. Too. No. <laughs> Milo's there. Cat's there. We all get a photo in the mirror. And I take, a, uh, you know, we've got the dog. Go to take a photo in the mirror. This guy could not jump quicker out of the photo. <gasps> Immediate red flag. Okay. Immediate red flag. Oh, okay. So, oh, so he has a girl. So, he, oh, oh, oh. Hold up. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. So, I say goodbye. Like, then this guy kisses me. He hasn't kissed me the whole time. Hasn't laid a fucking finger on me. Literally, like, I thought I smelt at one stage. I was starting to sniff <laughs> myself being like, is it fucking me? So, oh, I then gosh. go to my, like, you know, I'm like, okay, he kisses me goodbye. He puts the dog in the car and he says goodbye. All right, have a good time. Like, enjoy. And I was like, no worries. I'll see you when I get back. Au revoir. I'm driving down, listening to tunes, heading to Inverloch, which is about three hours away. You're on the highway and you look out your window and you see jogging. <laughs> and I stop off at a server and I'm checking my messages. And sometimes I occasionally check my message requests, right? Mm. I get a message from a chick who's saying, was it nice to meet my dog? And I said, your dog? She goes, yeah, my dog, Winston. That's my fiancé, Matt. Winston with a Y. Oh, my God. I said, babe, you need to call me now. And she calls me and I'm fucking shaking. I've only kissed this guy and I'm shaking. And I said, babe, your partner has stayed at my house a night. He stayed at my hotel one night in Cairns. And he's been, like, literally met my housemates. My Our dogs have met. And she was like, she immediately asked me if I had sex with him. And I said, fuck no. And I said, I will tell you everything. I will send you messages and I will show you. I met him off Tinder in Cairns. I told her everything. I was like, I, just, I, I need you to know because I would never, ever do this to someone, especially another female. <gasps> that is wow. not my jam. And oh he was gosh. fucking engaged and they got engaged. This is in April, by the way. This is only a couple of months ago. And they got the engagement party was end of March. Oh, fuck him. Where is he? Yeah, right. It was the worst oh. ever date and experience I've had of my fucking life. And I and that that turned me off for dating. I was like, I am switching back off. I'm wow. going. Oh my god. So yeah. 
Anyways, that was a bit of a long-winded story, but guys, honestly, do Don't your due diligence. No, do cares. your due diligence and stalk the fuck out of people. Yeah. This guy had no socials. I literally met him on Tinder. He jumped on Tinder, obviously, through he was on a conference. And I just for one minute I, I, I fucked say, up like, for a split second. I'm why, so good with that. Like why was he like if he wasn't gonna sleep with you, like what did he want? Like The like, Audacity. But, like, but, like what? Like, why? Normally if someone's gonna do that right, the reason is is to fuck like pump and dump see ya. <laughs> you know? Like it's not like they're gonna like hang out and date you. Like surely he he was like like why didn't he just like have sex with you and then just like ghost you? Yeah. Uh, you know? I would have much rather that or fucking... No, like, I mean, sorry, that, no. I wouldn't have rather no, that. Like, no, no, I'm of course. So glad I'm glad they just kissed I'm him. I'm glad right? that didn't happen, but that's normal. Like, wouldn't that be the normal intention of someone who's just going to cheat on their partner? Like, I you know, think that he would just be, like, hanging out, bringing the dog over and, like, chilling. Like, what the hell? And, right? Like, oh, that's that's weird. That's, like, serial killer shit. I then got to Inverloch and I could not write for three days. You took selfies with your car. I did. I did. I loved those photos. I, I was devastated. I, I loved those photos. I was like, is she there with someone or is she? No, I was by myself. <laughs> I looked very zen. You looked so zen. But I, I was, after that, I was actually quite traumatised and I, I felt like, you know what? I just don't trust men. I'm sorry. But I... This is the reason why, because I feel like I opened myself up again. I built the courage to do so, to jump on a fucking dating yeah. app, like something so random. And then that kind of, you know, came full circle and I was like, fuck. Like, you know, I just like was like, nah, not doing it, not wow. doing it. That that's a, that's a pretty crazy story. I even messaged her checking in on her the next day. Was she being open like, to communicate with you? She was. And I said to her... Like, I didn't even have a conversation with him after that. I deleted and blocked him. And I said, I told her that. I said, look, I would never do this. I've deleted and blocked him. I never want to speak to him ever again. And I just wish you got, you all the best. Can you just imagine being her? Like, the bachelorette stills my engaged boyfriend. Like, my... If she listens to this... Oh, God. I'm sure she probably fucking won't. But no. if she... I just want to say, like... I had no fucking take part. That it was all him. No, but can like, like just imagine her little heart shattering, being that's like, what I mean. "He's cheated on me with the fucking bachelorette." Like, come on. I am a nobody. It doesn't matter who you are, though. I agree. It's but still like, not that you're a nobody. So that it doesn't matter yeah. who you are. Yeah. About the cheating, it's like mm, yeah. fucking wankers. Anyways, that was my worst date. Okay. So. Can you up me on the worst date? That is the question. Do you want me to top you? Go well, on then. I mean, <laughs> go on then. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, you haven't been on a date in a while. I've been I'm on a date say. in five years, but I went on some pretty shit dates. Like, I was always scared of dating. I um, there was this one guy that I was talking to online for like a few weeks, and um, I was I was like sort of into him. I was into the idea of him, and um, like you know the image and and. Um, sort of getting to know him online. And then basically uh, I sort of cancelled twice. So he was like, we set something up. We're going to go on a date and I cancelled. And then the second time I did the same thing because I was just like, I I wasn't very confident in dating for some reason. And then the third time he said, three strikes and you're out. And I was like, that's hot. Okay, let's meet up. (laughs) (laughs) Try to mean, keep him Yeah, yeah. Toxic wow. fucking behaviour. And um, anyway, so I, I went on this date with him and I felt so much pressure. I was young. Like I was, what, 19 years old and he was like 29. And um, and I felt so much pressure just to choose the right restaurant. And um, like he was like, you need to choose. And like he put the ball in my court. And I was just like under all this pressure. It was like the world was caving in on me. You know when you're 19 and you just worry about the dumbest shit? Yeah. Like, um, and I just remember I was like, like, Texting my friend and just being like, "Where do I even take this guy? He's like twenty nine years old. Like, babe, I'm like fucking twenty seven, and I still don't know where to take people." My budget is Agalos, and like, what's that? <laughs> it's like a basically like a cheaper version of a Porto. Is it like and, <laughs> no? It's like it's like a, it's free like, salad bar. <laughs> it's like four ninety five for a meal, babe. And um, basically, like, I was just so stressed about where to go. Anyway, I ended up booking this. Um, <laughs> booking this um restaurant, and um, it was uh, Fratelli Fresh. And um, and I sort of got dressed up a little bit older than myself and wore a cardigan, 
And, nice. <laughs> and it was so bad because he told me that he hated the cardigan. And then he, there was like a, a thing for him. He hates cardigans. And, um, and, and so I took the cardigan off and I had a white shirt underneath and I ordered p- pasta. And so I started to like, you know, try and be adult and fancy and like eat the pasta. And I was eating the pasta and it all just fell down my white shirt at this restaurant while I was trying to impress this guy. Anyway, that didn't last long. It sort of lasted for about six weeks. And then I found out that he was um, sort of in a relationship. He was in a um, situationship (laughs) with someone from the US and that I was just like, he was planning on moving to there and I was just his little. Wow. Well, you can live through my dating experiences because I I have had a few. I have had a few. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm glad that I, oh, I'm so happy that I don't have to be out there putting myself out there like that. Only because I'm not a, I'm not a confident dater. Like I'd much prefer to get drunk and meet someone in a club and just like kiss them. That's how I met my first girlfriend. Like, oh God, sounds too daunting for me. All right, well we've come to the last question, mm. and this is one that. I got in my inbox, which is really interesting. And I want to know, (laughs) (laughs) I want to know if you know what this is, because it was a question that was brought up um, in in the burning questions box. And it's, do you know what docking is? Now, Brooke Blurton, do you know what docking is? I have no fucking clue. Okay. Well, if I'm, if I um, was to give you a couple of clues, would you be able to guess it, do you think? Go on, hit me. Okay. So um, it's a plus and a plus, and they come together <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible fucking clues. But a docking is when um, a penis and another penis come together and the foreskin overlaps the other one and, like, swallows it like a mouth. <laughs> You're kidding. No, it's fucking odd. It's very odd. So you, you need to have at least one dick with a foreskin. I have heard it all in terms of like I've worked with young people who haven't told me what blue waffle is and like all sorts. I have never, ever heard the term docking. I don't know what the pleasure is in it either. Like, So basically what it is is when the peanut, like say the eye of the dick is facing each other and they're like staring at each other and then they touch and then the hood of one of the penises wraps around the other penis and it's like a cosy blanket. <laughs> no, not that I've fucking done it, I promise. I can't I use never. cosy blanket in a sentence anymore but, because you've literally <laughs> fucking traumatised me. Uh, what? Yeah, and I don't know what the plan Like, I don't get it, but... um. When you def- said I, I was like, I have a tiger. I don't know why, but I don't know where I went. I was like, I don't... break out the song. No, but yeah, it's very odd. I think it's um like more of a um. Did someone ask us what docking is? Yeah. Oh, do we dock one another? Is that what they you want? You could never dock me, even if you tried. I like, do have big dick energy. I can. I must admit. <laughs> All right, that's a great place to leave this episode of Not So PG <laughs> on docking. How wonderful! <laughs> well, thanks you, Mob, for listening to Not So PG with me, Maddie Mills, and me, Brooke Burton. Don't forget to rate and review the pod in Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And check the description of this episode for links to all our socials where we have fun. See ya.